Hello, I'm Steve Paulson. Do trees and squirrels and even rats have the same rights as people? Do the creatures of nature deserve the legal protections that humans enjoy? Some radical environmentalists say they do, and historian Roderick Nash believes the birth of environmental ethics is one of the most significant developments in intellectual history. Nash became interested in environmental ethics when he was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin in the early 1960s. He collected the papers of the great ecologist Aldo Leopold and later went on to write many books, including the classic study Wilderness and the American Mind. Now teaching at the University of California, Santa Barbara, his new book is The Rights of Nature, A History of Environmental Ethics. Professor Nash, let's start out with a definition. What do we mean by the term environmental ethics? Ethics, of course, has to do with um, what's right and wrong, concepts of right and wrong. And we sometimes use the term morals or morality in the same in, in uh, synonyms for that. And environmental ethics simply means that we extend our concepts of right and wrong, the things that uh, guide our actions and restrain our action, we extend those things we're accustomed to use in dealing with other human beings to nature or to various parts of nature, to the environment, if you will. So environmental ethics is a very new field, something that you wouldn't have found even as a name in a philosophy course uh, 15 years ago. But in the last 15 years, there's been an extraordinary amount of attention to this interesting, I think very exciting idea of extending ethics from the human to human or the human to God relationship to the human to nature relationship. You make a very dramatic claim in your book. You write that environmental ethics could be seen as the most important expansion of the concept of morality, even in the history of human thought. I do that, and here's why I think this is the case. When we, when we talk about human ethics, and by that I mean human to human ethics, we talk about gradual increases of the circle of morality uh, from uh, what initially, I suppose, was the king and a few of his uh, consorts to a broader group of nobility and then to a broader group of people. Uh, over the last several hundred years, we've seen ethics expand to include uh, black people, to include women. Uh, and but each of those extensions was only adding something of the same kind to the circle of morality. Uh, that is the jump from saying all white people have ethics to saying all black people have ethics to me is not as great as is saying all people are subject to ethical concerns and have intrinsic values. And jumping from that to say that non-human creatures and even ecological systems have rights, if you will. And that's why when I title my book The Rights of Nature, I am hitting right there at what I take to be the most extraordinary single leap in ethics that uh, we've ever undergone. So to put it simply, you're saying in this line of thought, animals have rights, trees have rights, all creatures of nature have rights. Well, let's, let's make this clear at the, at the outset. Uh, I, I am not saying this so much as the people that I'm writing about. It would be more accurate to say, since I'm just really a reporter here, I'm an intellectual historian writing about a change in ideas, it would be more accurate to say that there are those who believe that animals have rights. There are those who believe the trees have rights. There are those who believe that rivers have rights. And even some who believe that the earth as a whole has rights. Let's go back in time and try to put this new development in some kind of historical perspective, I suppose we need to talk about the natural rights tradition going back to people like John Locke and even going back further than that to really where that concept of natural rights was founded. Usually it's thought that it, it came into being with the writing of the Magna Carta in 1215. How does that understanding of the natural rights tradition put this issue in some kind of context? Right, I think that's a very interesting way to approach it. Uh, we could actually go back further than the Magna Carta, back to um, classical thought, um, Greek and Roman thought, where there was an idea that uh, there was a, a, a juice natural, a natural justice, <clears throat> that existed prior to, and indeed superior to, that of any state or nation, a, a natural system of justice. And the basis of that natural system of justice was 
that um, there were what we should call existence rights, that by simply by virtue of existing, something had rights. And it's interesting to me that back in, in the Greco-Roman tradition, there was even some indication that animals were included, certain kinds of animals were included in this uh, uh, jus natural, this uh, natural order of justice. And that atrophied uh, for a thousand years or so, primarily under the impact of Christianity, which we may want to talk about a little bit later, its impact. But then, as you say, about 1215, uh, with Magna Carta, we begin to find in the West groups of people saying, we want our rights. We think we have rights because we exist. We want rights, and initially it was, against the king, against the crown. So Magna Carta represented a very few nobles getting together and forcing the king of England to give them, by virtue of this document, the Magna Carta, or the Great Charter, to give them certain rights. So they weren't just, uh, the, uh, their property couldn't be confiscated, that their lives couldn't be taken with, uh, without uh, a just cause, and so on. And this was the beginning of the Western tradition of natural rights, which, of course, John Locke uh, articulated in the late 17th century. And it was Locke's articulation, particularly this idea of life, liberty, and property, as he initially put it, that we picked up in the United States. And we, we um, uh, find Thomas Jefferson then in 1776 in the well-known uh, phrase in the Declaration of Independence saying that, that all men are, are created equal and in, entitled to certain inalienable rights. And that's an important term. Inalienable rights means these are existence rights. These are rights that cannot be taken away from them by a state or by a nation. And among these inalienable rights, Jefferson enumerates the three we're very familiar with, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that was the beginning of a natural rights tradition in the, in the United States. Uh, but, you know, Jefferson, when he said all men are created equal and entitled to these rights, didn't, of course, really mean that. That's right. All black people were not treated yes, equally as all white people. Yes, women were not included. Uh, Indians were not included. And neither, it, it's surprising to some of my students to realize, were poor people. In many states, um, unless you were a property owner, you didn't have the right to vote, and you didn't have certain other legal rights. So somebody who rented an apartment, say, in Madison, Wisconsin, and went to graduate school there, would not be as equal as someone who owned a house. And um, it was a substantial member of the community. Now, gradually, we dropped those property rights. We said everybody has uh, these inalienable rights. And gradually, uh, blacks came in to the picture. We can date that um, fairly specifically in um, 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation, where we said, we said, meaning uh, the Union said, that uh, we can no longer own human beings, that these people have certain rights and they cannot be treated as property. Of course, it took a civil war to prove that point. And then gradually other groups were added uh, to it. Um, I, in the book, I, I sort of suggest that maybe uh, the uh, addition of the vote for women in 1920, when women achieved the vote, could be seen as a step toward that direction. And you were saying that if we follow this progression of, I suppose, what we could call the development of liberalism, particularly in the American tradition, the next step could conceivably be seen as the rights of nature, as following on the, the rights of women, the rights of minorities. This is the next frontier. This is the next ethical frontier. And you see, in the United States, we've always had a very strong knee-jerk reaction to the term oppression and to the term tyranny. These were terms we used uh, in talking about England when we fought for our independence in 1776, the American Revolution. So anytime that you define a, a group, uh, a group of um, people initially and then a group of other things, any, anytime you define them as being oppressed and deserving of liberation, these are very hot words in the American vocabulary, liberation, oppression, tyranny, and people get behind these things and say, yes, you know, liberate the, you know, whatever it would be. First it was liberate the colonies, and it was liberate the slaves, liberate women, and we have the familiar term women's liberation, a gay liberation, and so forth. And now we find the more radical environmentalists saying, what about these other creatures that are out here in our wider community? Uh, what about animals? Uh, what about uh, nature itself? Uh, is not nature oppressed in the same way that, say, slaves were once oppressed? So that the... Uh, the liberation of uh, black people uh, would sort of segue directly in, in some people's minds, to, well, the next step is the liberation of the land that we buy and sell, just like we once bought and sold slaves, and that we often abuse, just like we used to abuse slaves. 
And there are some environmentalists who make that connection to the abolitionist movement quite explicitly, that they see themselves very much like uh, the abolitionists of the mid-19th century. That's right, and that's one of the interesting parts of the book, the, um, the final, the epilogue, where I make an explicit comparison between the abolitionists of the mid-19th century and the radical environmentalists of the mid-20th century. And I try to suggest that there are many, many parallels between these two groups. They both started out, to just take a couple of them at first here, they both started out very much in the minority, scorned, hated, uh, ridiculed, in some cases even killed, uh, abolitionists, that is, tarred and feathered, and not only in the southern states, but in the north. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison is a perfect case in point. In 1831, he started the Liberator, a famous abolitionist newspaper, and Garrison initially had no subscribers at all. He gradually developed uh, a little subscription list, and people hated him. They thought he was a rabble raffle. They thought he was going to break up the Union. They thought he was going to disturb domestic tranquility. But Garrison said in his famous manifesto in the beginning uh, of the Liberator in 1831, he said, I will not compromise, I will not equivocate, I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. He said, on the subject of slavery, I am not going to compromise. Uh, and it's interesting that the more radical environmentalists today use that same phrase of Garrison's when they say, no compromise in defense of Mother Earth. That's at Earth First. Earth First is an organization, and that's what that's their slogan. No compromise in defense of Mother Earth. Garrison said, no compromise with slavery. No compromise. We're going to free the slaves. We're not going to free them on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're not going to free them partway. Uh, we're going to free the slaves because slavery is morally wrong. And then an expanded concept of ethics demands a slavery end. And now people are saying that the, the enslavement of nature is morally wrong and that that should end. So to make a distinction here, this is very much a moral movement rather than, say, a political movement because the art of politics is, of course, compromise. That's true. But you know, uh, Steve, it's interesting that uh, where compromise, the process of compromise, fails us is when we sometimes define issues in terms of right and wrong. It failed us in the Civil War. We did not settle the Civil War short of, of the battlefield. There were proposals made. But they always ran up against the problem that the part of the nation, as Abraham Lincoln said, believed slavery was right, and part of the nation believed slavery was wrong. And Lincoln called that a house divided. I think any study of the American political system suggests that the only reason it works is that people are basically agreed on moral fundamentals. We've been talking as if there's just been this steady progression recognizing the rights of nature throughout history. Of course, things are not so easy as that. There's a long tradition that views nature differently, and we can go back to the philosopher Descartes, who very explicitly distinguished people from animals because he assumed that only people had the capacity to think, going back to his famous dictum, I think, therefore I am. Right. If you couldn't think, you weren't anything of importance, and therefore you didn't have any rights. And exactly, and Descartes also said that animals didn't have any feelings, that they were just machines. And therefore, it was perfectly okay to, say, have a, a live dissection of animals. It's called the dissection, where in medical schools you would take a dog and strap this a dog to a board and carve it up and uh, watch this operation of its heart and so forth, of course, killing it. Others came on not too long after Descartes and began to say, we think animals do suffer and do have uh, an experience of pain and are much more like us than they are different from us as organisms. And this was the beginning of what I take to be one of the first a harbingers of this ethical revolution, and that is the rights of animals movement, the humane movement, which began in England very strongly, carried over the United States with the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, and of course initially only concerned dogs and cats and horses and cows and things like that, but at least it was a stepping stone away from a totally anthropocentric sense of ethics, where only people were to be included. Here now some folks are coming on and saying animals should be included. But one point you make in your book is that the anti-vivisectionists were still so uh, focused on humans, they objected to these experiments on animals because it somehow seemed wrong to humans. It, it somehow upset humans, and therefore it was wrong, rather than fundamentally saying you're violating the rights of these animals. Yeah, that's an important distinction, um, Steve, that we have to we see all through this ethics. There's sort of two ways of, of treating the rights of nature. One is to say that the violation of the rights of nature is a violation of the rights of people. 
That is, if we abuse nature, we're going to abuse the capacity of the earth to support human life. And we're going, if we cut down a forest completely and or we destroy a river, we're going to destroy its value to humans. And that's what we call an instrumental uh, sense of evaluation. Instrumental, where the value, say, of the forest or the river or the animal is only insofar as it is useful to human beings. Now, there's a more radical sense, and that is the intrinsic value argument. That says that the forest or the river or the animal has value in and of itself, regardless of any use that it might have to human beings. And that's the more radical one that I think underlies environmental ethics. But the fact that nature does have utility to human beings shouldn't be ignored, and some people still argue very effectively that in danger, let's take endangered species, that a species should not become extinct because it might have usefulness to human beings. I call it the cure for cancer argument. There might be some obscure species of beetle in a Wisconsin bog, and if we let it go extinct, who knows, it might have had the chemical enzyme that would have cured cancer and saved our mother-in-law. Well, that's, right? the, that's, that's the, the same argument that is often used against the destruction of tropical rainforests exactly. in Brazil. Uh, you, you can't reduce the total number of species because, who knows, we may need certain organisms. We may need some, and we, and we may find that uh, well, extinction is forever, after all, and once it goes, we can't recreate it. So that's the, that's the uh, concept that has been very strong uh, behind the endangered species legislation to protect habitat and protect endangered species. But what I want to make clear is that while that instrumental argument has been politically effective, uh, the more radical one is that that obscure beetle in the rainforest or wherever it might be has intrinsic value uh, to pursue life, uh, pursue liberty, pursue its own definition of happiness, which of course doesn't mean drinking margaritas and driving jaguars, but you know, doing what beetles do. That's, that's the way that the, that the environmental ethics takes natural rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and says, look, we can define this in such a way that a tree has a sense of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. We'll return in a moment to Steve Paulson's conversation with historian Roderick Nash, author of The Rights of Nature. You're listening to Wisconsin Public Radio. It's 18 minutes past 2 o'clock. Wisconsin Public Radio is sponsoring a tailgate party at Milwaukee County Stadium Sunday, June 25th, when the Brewers play the White Sox in an afternoon game. Tickets are $13 for lower grandstand seats and $10 for the upper grandstand. Beverages and snacks are included in the price. To order tickets by mail, you can send a check to Tailgate, care of 4455 North Larkin Street, that's L-A-R-K-I-N Street, Shorewood, Wisconsin, 53211. Include your name, address, and daytime phone number, or you can charge your tickets by phone by calling 608-273-6900. That's 608-273-6900. Back now to Steve Paulson. We've talked earlier about the influence of a philosopher like Descartes who made the argument that humans were intrinsically more valuable. Another very strong tradition that perhaps launches the same argument is the Christian tradition. Some people have argued that the Christian tradition, uh, if you look at the book of Genesis, it seems to say uh, man has dominion over nature. Man is the ruler of nature. It seems to be an anti-ecological book. Uh, others have disputed that. Uh, what should we make of the Bible? Well, th this is, of course, a very, very important foundation of of our thinking in the West, and any, any system of ethics has to kind of come to terms with Judeo-Christian morality. And uh, I think the point that needs to be made at the outset is that uh, Christianity, like many other uh, belief systems, means different things to different people. Words can be interpreted differently. So that there isn't the way I like to teach the concept is there isn't a Christian meaning or a Christian sense of nature. There is various senses. And initially, as you point out, for thousands of years, the way the Christians traditionally understood the human nature relationship was the following. God created human beings uh, as the uh, primary, in his image, as the primary creatures on earth, and then created other things for man's use. And man was given, according to Genesis 128, uh, the right to uh, conquer and subdue 
uh, have dominion over everything that creepeth and crawleth and flieth in that in that interesting biblical language. And for thousands of years, people took that as a go-ahead to, to use nature for anything they wanted to. That ethics didn't really apply. That nature was just there for us, and that we could do with it what we wanted. Uh, that idea, coupled with the interesting thought that human beings did not come from the earth, from the Mother Earth of the Indian tradition, say, but rather were placed by God, uh, by a God in heaven, placed on earth, and then if they were good and lived the Christian life, they would be taken back to heaven, out of the earth. Uh, this is a very different creation myth than that of uh, Aboriginal peoples who had a sort of instinctive environmental ethic. And their ethic was centered on the idea that they came from the earth and went back to the earth, and that they were creatures of the earth. The Christian idea is the earth is just a very uneasy, temporary purgatory, and that it probably is going to be destroyed anyway by a vengeful God, sort of like a Noah situation. And so your aspirations, as a good Christian, say, in the Middle Ages, should be on heaven, uh, not on the taking care of your earthly environment or habitat. And we could also make distinctions between the Christian tradition and certain Asian religions, Buddhism, Taoism, that seem to be more environmentally conscious, that seem to recognize the value of other creatures in nature and uh, don't seem to give human beings dominion over nature, as at least That's in right. some people's find, minds Christianity find does. particularly anthropocentric in this regard. Many other uh, religious traditions, those that you named and others, suggest that every, every individual, every inhabitant of, of the universe, be it human, non-human, even rocks, had a spirit had its own particular sense or spirit that was valuable and that intrinsic value and that was acknowledged by the creator and this opened up the idea of respect for other forms of life uh, and respect for even uh, the sun and the moon and the rocks and the non-living components of the earth so the idea of environmental ethics is, is much less uh, foreign to these non-christian traditions than it is to traditional christianity but now the point that has to be made is that we have seen in the last 25 years uh, a real change in the way the Christians have understood Genesis 128. Uh, they have began to say that this phrase conquer and have dominion really should be read as stewardship. That the, the nature was not just placed here for human beings to, in, to enjoy and use, but that it was also created by God and that humans as the sort of superior creature in the chain of being had a stewardly responsibility to husband and take care of nature. And this they sort of do as the agents of God on earth. And this stewardship idea was the first um, a step in the what I call the greening of religion in the 1960s and 1970s in the United States, where churches began to take a look at nature, take a look at the human nature relationship and say, you know, we do have some, some responsibilities here. There is, however, a more radical Judeo-Christian position now, uh, by that I mean the last 25 years, which suggests uh, uh, what, I, what is sort of a big word, theological egalitarianism. The idea that all creatures and all natural things are equal in the eyes of God, that they are part of an expanded kingdom of God, and that they have intrinsic value. And that we don't just take care of them as stewards because uh, we want them to serve us over a long time and we want to be kindly masters. But rejecting the whole concept of mastery, they say we are all in one big community. And that God really looks the same way at the sparrow and at the wolf and at the tree as he does at the human beings. And that he values all of them. And that uh, since we have power, we have a special responsibility to restrain that power. And that's where, of course, ethics come into play. Of course, the problem is that human beings can alter the environment as no other being can do. Human beings are certainly special, and I guess the question is, ethically, does that give them more rights, or does that give them more responsibilities? Can you get away from that concept of stewardship, given that human beings are so powerful? The power is, of course, what makes uh, ethics so important. If you don't have the power to abuse, uh, then it's not as important that you have restraints on that power. And you're absolutely right. In the last 200 years, we've seen the enormous exponential increase of human ability to affect the Earth, to affect the environment. And, of course, the classic uh, instance of that is atomic energy, where we now hold, within a push of the button, the ability to radically alter, if not destroy, most parts of the ecosystem, including ourselves. And because of that power, we have the need for restraint. That's where ethics come into play. Now, the way I, I usually explain this uh, in teaching situations is 
Um, look at uh, a bunch of five-year-olds in kindergarten, okay? They are not restrained by too many ethics at that stage. They haven't become um, fully educated ethically. And they are selfish, and they hit each other, and Mary strikes John with a train and so forth. But Mary only weighs 27 pounds, see, and doesn't have the power to really do too much damage. And John cries, and the teacher comes and says, we must share, and John has rights too, and Mary gradually learns that John has rights too, and so it goes. Now consider, if Mary was a 250-pound linebacker for the Badgers, okay? And when Mary is five years old and has the ethical, the lack of restraints of a five-year-old, Mary slugs John with a train, she decapitates him. That's where we are as a civilization. We have the power of a 250-pound football linebacker and the ethical restraints, it seems to me, of about a three- or four-year-old. And what environmental ethics as a movement, I suppose, is trying to do is help us to grow up ethically and hope that it's fast enough that we don't um, destroy ourselves along with our whole habitat uh, before we develop those kinds of restraints. Let's step back into history once again and talk about how some of these ideas took root in the United States in particular. For many years, the United States was probably a backwater of environmental thinking if we compare thinkers in this country with thinkers in England, for instance. There seemed to be more, to use a modern term, ecologically minded thinkers in England. There were people in previous centuries who spoke of the rights of beasts, for instance. Well, there was this long tradition of thinking in America that you could never exhaust the frontier. There was always more wilderness, so there was always plenty of space for both nature and people. When did some of this thinking, some of this environmentally minded thinking, start to take root in the United States? Well, it took, it took root very slowly, and you point out uh, rightly that England uh, was far ahead of us, particularly in the humane movement and the rights of animals. Um, uh, England, of course, abolished slavery 50 years or more before we did, and then turned to the next ethical frontier, which was the enslavement of animals. Uh, we were still... Uh, uh, dealing with the abolitionist movement and the, and the denial of rights to other human beings, while England was already sort of on the next level, uh, talking about the rights, the rights of beasts and so forth. Now, the people who started this in America were um, uh, familiar names, I think, to most of your listeners. Henry David Thoreau, for example, uh, was is well known for his ideas on wilderness, and I've written about that in Wilderness in the American Mind. Uh, but he also had a very strong sense that his community included non-human creatures. When he was out at Walden Pond in the 1840s, he talked about the sunfish and the, and the rabbits and the fox and the birds that were around his cabin as, as his fellow beings. He defined uh, wildness as a civilization other than our own. He did not use the phrase rights of nature or rights of these creatures, but he definitely deplored the expansionist, uh, Jacksonian, manifest destiny urge that was transforming the land. He bemoaned the fact that so few of his contemporaries were giving any thought to this. And Thoreau really was a very radical ethical thinker. He really did, I believe, understand that uh, nature had rights, although he didn't use the term. But he was a very lonely thinker, too. I mean, his contemporaries thought of Thoreau more in political terms than as a nature writer, didn't they? That's right. Of course, Thoreau is well known for his concepts of civil disobedience and his opposition to slavery, and it ties, it ties right in. Thoreau saw those, those as very similar, his, his ideas about nature and his ideas about slavery. Thoreau saw many parallels this way. Uh, now, Thoreau, of course, was regarded as a kook by his contemporaries. He was laughed at. He was largely ignored. It's a great mistake to read uh, Thoreau's contemporary reputation back into the 19th century. His books didn't sell. Uh, he was regarded as an eccentric at best and um, died, I'm sure, feeling that most of his ideas were not understood by his contemporaries. Not so the next guy who came on and made a strong uh, state of environmental ethics, and that was John Muir. Muir was born in Scotland, moved to Wisconsin, lived on a Wisconsin farm for a number of years, and uh, rejected his father's strict uh, Christianity. And uh, early on in his life, um, decided that he would devote himself to wilderness and to wild creatures, and formed an idea that these creatures actually had rights, as good as his own. And he was the first American to use the phrase rights of nature, or rights in connection with natural things. Muir, uh, Muir was an amazingly radical, even extending his ethics to things like rattlesnakes and alligators and things that are potentially harmful to human beings. Uh, he said, uh, these creatures uh, are, are part of our ethical community and uh, 
his um, his early writings, particularly in the 1860s and 70s, were full of, of really uh, astonishingly radical ideas. John Muir. And Muir went on to become widely celebrated, uh, acknowledged as one of the great writers in America, given honorary degrees, in contrast to Thoreau. And in explaining the difference, I think those 50 years have to come between the prime of Thoreau and the prime of Muir have to come into consideration. Because when Muir was, was, was at the peak of his influence, about 1900 or so, uh, he was benefiting from the fact that the frontier was over, that Americans were beginning to rethink their historical relationship to nature, that uh, there was a growing uh, concern for wilderness and that strict uh, Christianity. And uh, early on in his life... Um, decided that he would devote himself to wilderness and to wild creatures and formed an idea that these creatures actually had rights as good as his own. And he is the first American to use the phrase rights of nature, or rights in connection with natural things. Muir, uh, Muir was amazingly radical, even extending his ethics to things like rattlesnakes and alligators and things that are potentially harmful to human beings. Uh, he said uh, these creatures uh, are, are part of our ethical community and uh, his, um, his early writings, particularly in the 1860s and 70s, were full of, of really uh, astonishingly radical ideas. John Muir. And Muir went on to become widely celebrated, uh, acknowledged as one of the great writers in America, given honorary degrees, in contrast to Thoreau. And in explaining the difference, I think those 50 years have to come between the prime of Thoreau and the prime of Muir have to come into consideration. Because when Muir was, was, was at the peak of his influence, about 1900 or so, uh, he was benefiting from the fact the frontier was over, that Americans were beginning to rethink their historical relationship to nature, that uh, there was a growing uh, concern for wilderness and national parks. Muir started a group called the Sierra Club in 1892. Uh, more people were disposed to look favorably at his ideas. The road happened to just come 50 years too early. But yet, if you look at Muir's last couple decades or so, he doesn't seem to be that radical a thinker. He seems more in tune with the conservation thinking of the time that you want to set aside nature for the benefit of human beings. Yeah, he, he does um, say that, and of course so does Aldo Leopold, who we'll probably talk about in a little while, because these people were capable of being political realists and realizing that most people were not going to respond to ideas about the rights of nature, but they would respond to the idea that, that nature had benefits for human beings, that old instrumental theory of value that we talked about earlier. So my theory is that Muir sort of swallowed some of his radical ideas in order to um, expound some theories that were more likely to be accepted by people. And um, in other words, tone down his radicalism in order to be more politically effective. Well, let's move on to the case of Aldo Leopold, whom you've just mentioned. Of course, there's another Wisconsin connection there. He taught for many years at the University of Wisconsin, and I know he had a profound influence on you as well. Leopold, like many other ecologists, had a hard time early in his career coming to terms with the concept of predators. He, he didn't like predators. He didn't think they were as, as good as the deer and, and other creatures, squirrels that were running around, and, and he wasn't particularly reluctant about killing predators. Uh, how did he change his thinking there? That's very true. Um, Aldo Leopold is one of those, uh, was one of those uh, rare individuals who had the ability to make uh, an intellectual about face midway through his life. I mean, a 180 degree turn around. And, and more power to him, you know, that he was able to do that. And I'll, I'll sketch briefly the process of, uh, through which that occurred. Leopold um, was born in 1886 uh, in Iowa. He went to Yale. He studied at the Yale Forest School which was a very utilitarian idea. Nothing about the rights of trees. The reason trees were valuable at the Yale Forest School was because they produced lumber, and that was good for people, and you better take care of them for that reason. Leopold grew up in that idea, this sort of pre-ecological thinking, that there were good parts of nature and there were bad parts of nature. And the good parts were deer, and the bad parts were the animals that ate deer, like wolves and bears and so forth. So um, this... Um, way of thinking uh, was, uh, was something Leopold brought with him out to the southwest when he came out to uh, New Mexico and Arizona about 1911. And it was there that he began these predator extermination campaigns. And he was uh, dogged in them. Uh, he said the last wolf and the last bear must be exterminated from New Mexico and Arizona. 
And he even has a wonderful passage where he recalls shooting an old she-wolf and some of her cubs that he saw on one of his rides in, in New Mexico. And he came down as she was still dying. He'd, he'd already crippled her with his bullet. And he watched, he said, the, the fierce green fire die in the old wolf's eyes. And he realized, I think, a little later than this incident, but this may have been one of the key turning points in his life here, that, that the wolf was part of what we were beginning to think of as an ecosystem. But the predator had a role, and that to, to kill off predators because they were bad animals uh, made no sense ecologically, that you needed the predator in order to have the healthy herd of deer. In other words, Leopold said, when he shot these predators in his early life, he was not thinking like a mountain, a phrase that he used. He was not thinking like a mountain. A mountain, he said, thinks about the whole. The mountain understands that the wolf and the bear and the deer and the mountain lion are all part of a system. And uh, Leopold uh, gradually began to understand, when he was exposed to the wilderness of the Southwest, that there was an order here. There was a kind of a harmony here in nature that man was disrupting. And most of his later life was given over to trying to get people to understand uh, something he called a land ethic. The land ethic that enlarged the boundaries of human morality to include uh, soil and rivers and animals, all kinds of animals, deer and wolves and bears and lions together. And the land ethic remains one of the real milestones in the American emergence of an environmental ethic. But that concept of bad species and good species is actually very difficult to get rid of. I think most people now would say that predators are important, but they wouldn't say that certain animals are important. They wouldn't say that rats are important, for instance. They wouldn't say that mosquitoes are important. And most people would just as soon get rid of those animals because uh, they're, they're incredible pests, for one thing, and, and to some degree they are genuine health risks to human beings. Um, yeah, and uh, there is a strong strong tendency to think that way. But to go back to Muir for a moment, uh, Muir at one point was asked by someone who was obviously a critic of his ideas, uh, who, who asked Muir, he said, what good are rattlesnakes? And Muir said they're good for themselves, regardless of any human good or ill that they may cause. They're good for themselves. Um, let's take rats for a minute, because they often come in at the, at the bottom of the moral pecking order for a lot of people. Uh, I think radical environmentalists, deep ecologists, to use another term, would say that um, uh, rats have as much right to exist, essential right to exist, as any other form of life on this planet. Uh, rats happen to uh, live in a certain way that uh, disturbs us. Um, we have a certain right to live, too, to protect our uh, interest in our own pursuit of environmental happiness, if you will. So that killing a rat or swatting a mosquito or eating a turnip or eating a deer and killing a deer to eat is not, in this expanded view, considered uh, a violation of environmental ethics. Uh, however, if uh, you extended this to the idea of exterminating rats, completely wiping them out, then people would draw the line and say, wait a minute, I don't think perhaps this is a morally responsible position to take. And you know, we came, uh, one of the interesting discussions of this is in relation to the germ smallpox, which we have largely, um, con which we now have confined to only two or three laboratories in the world. This is fascinating to me. Here is an organism, smallpox, that preys on human beings. I mean, that's what it does, and it kills human beings. And of course, it was a great scourge in the past. But there are now some bacteriologists and others, and Rene Dubose was one of the famous ones, who said, you know, to completely eradicate smallpox, to, to take this part of the, of, the, of the universe and just say, it will be no more. We have the power to do that now because we have it confined to a couple laboratories. Uh, might not be such a good thing. Uh, maybe the same logic that protects uh, an endangered species like the whooping crane or the California condor or something ought to be extended to, to even germs. And here is the ultimate submergence, Steve, of a human ego in this concept of an environmental ethics. You've got to remember that all this is very hard for humans to understand because it represents the submergence of the human ego, the backing off of a lot of things that we've done uh, for thousands and millions of years even. But if those smallpox germs are just kept alive in laboratories, yeah. that, that doesn't seem to say much for, uh, say, the rights of those germs. I mean, still, human beings are controlling the destiny of that that's, species. That's true. And I suppose, I suppose a, really, a really radical thinker would say we should liberate these smallpox germs and let them go back and do their thing and kill people. 
but that, of course, shows you how radical environmental ethics can really be if you really do assume that everything that exists has rights. Uh, that pushes it so far that it almost becomes sort of a reductum absurdo, you know, that people uh, uh, just sort of tune you out. And I, when I'm talking about these ideas, I don't like to, to get into that too much because um, you, know, you do have such a strong knee-jerk reaction. But there are people who do say that. There are some people who would say killing uh, a human being is no worse than killing a snake. There are those. John Muir said essentially that. Uh, Garrett Hardin and others have said today that the value of a redwood tree is more valuable than the uh, one additional human life. And, and he means it. He says with 5.5 billion human beings on Earth and only a limited number of redwood trees, if he had to make a choice between one additional human being and an additional redwood tree, he'd choose the tree. And people say, what? How can you say that? But he's talking about relative numbers here. He's saying we already have a lot of human beings and we've made a lot of modifications of the globe. Maybe it's time to back off and let other forms of life and other systems have their place in the sun, too. Well, if we follow this line of thinking a little bit about uh, if we do try to attach uh, uh, some kind of value, relative value, to different species, some people have made the argument that those species at the bottom end of the food chain, the plankton in the sea, the species that really make it all happen later on are the crucial ones. If you start to eliminate those, then you start to eliminate all the ones at the top. And in some respects, human beings are more expendable then. You've been doing your homework very well. This is, this is certainly an idea that biologists at least understand very clearly. If you take the top rungs of the food chain, including us and uh, the carnivores and the predatory birds and so forth, fish and so forth, out, um, you know, you still have basically a functioning ecosystem. But if you eliminate uh, soil bacteria, if you eliminate uh, phytoplankton in the ocean, if you eliminate these humble uh, members of the ecosystem, uh, the others can't survive and the whole thing collapses. It's, it's like a pyramid uh, effect here. And the lower levels are vitally important to supporting the upper ones. Uh, so that uh, another way to, to kind of look at this, and it's sort of interesting way that the, the poet, a friend of mine, Gary Snyder, puts it. Snyder says that the bacteria and the worms and the humble, humble members of the ecosystem are the proletariat, that they support the upper levels. And he says, that if we do not respect their rights, they will revolt against us. And that revolt will be in the form of a sick ecosystem and we will all perish. So he, in an interesting sort of neo-Marxist way, he kind of talks about the rights of, of bacteria and so forth as, uh, as, you know, fundamental ones in the ecosystem. You're listening to Wisconsin Public Radio. The time is 17 and a half minutes before 3 o'clock. Stay tuned. At 3 o'clock, it's Monitor Radio from Boston. Stay tuned at 4 for All Things Considered. Mostly clear in tonight's forecast for Wisconsin. Lows in the upper 30s in the northeast to the upper 40s in the southwest. Partly to mostly cloudy and windy tomorrow in the west with a chance of showers or thunderstorms. Central and east, sunny early, then partly cloudy and breezy with a chance of afternoon thunderstorms. Warmer with highs in the 70s. Chance of showers and thunderstorms on Memorial Day. It's 59 degrees now in Milwaukee, sunny skies, sunny in Madison in 66, 63 degrees with sunshine in Wausau. Back now for the conclusion of Steve Paulson's interview with the University of California Santa Barbara historian Roderick Nash. Let's talk about how some of these ideas have been applied in the last few decades. We've, of course, been referring to movements such as the deep ecology movement to the radical environmental group Earth First. The concept that species, animals in particular, have certain rights has become very concrete in recent decades, and the argument was even made before the Supreme Court, and apparently the Supreme Court Justice William Douglas accepted some of that argument in, in this famous uh, case of whether trees have rights. Tell us what the occasion was for Justice Douglas even considering this issue. Yeah, that's an interesting case because it occurs uh, occurred in the early 1970s, at a time when some of these ideas were just being discussed. And here's, here's what happened. There was a valley out in California in the Sierra called Mineral King. It was uh, a wild valley, uh, and it uh, was also a place where there was a lot of snowfall. And Walt Disney Enterprises wanted to put a major ski resort out there. Uh, it was on public land. It was on Forest Service land. 
And um, Disney had in mind a great big fail or Aspen type of e-development. Um, there were protests by the Sierra Club and others about this on this issue. And as part of the discussion of it, uh, a young lawyer by the name of Christopher Stone wrote an interesting article called, Should Trees Have Standing? And by standing, Stone did not mean standing tall in the forest. He meant legal standing. In other words, and by trees, he was also a shorthand for nature. Should nature have standing in our courts? Should nature be a party in our legal disputes? In other words, was this Mineral King case just a case of Walt Disney versus the Sierra Club, say, or in some way was the Sierra Club speaking for nature and articulating its interests? Uh, this was sort of the unthinkable idea that Stone proposed, that maybe our legal system was too narrow because we only recognized human interests in it. Maybe we should begin to recognize the interests of other things. So Stone proposed this in, a, uh, in an essay. Uh, William O. Douglas uh, read that essay and uh, wrote a minority opinion that the three other justices, I believe, agreed to, that uh, the proper term of this in this case should not be uh, the Sierra Club versus Morton. Morton happened to be the Secretary of the Interior at the time. But rather it should be Mineral King, the Valley versus the U.S. government, with the Sierra Club being the spokesman for the Valley. And uh, in a very interesting opinion, Douglas, who of course was a long-time defender of wilderness and understood to that, uh, Douglas mentions Alda Leopold, he talks about a land ethic, he says it's time the American system of jurisprudence expand to accept the idea that trees should have standing, or you could say rights. Uh, interesting ideas in the early 1970s. Of course, Douglas lost, or lost. He, was, he was on the losing side there. The losing side of that, but ultimately, Disney did back out, and the development was not made in Mineral King, and Mineral King was added to Sequoia National Park in 1978. But that was primarily because the economic attrition uh, that Disney had been so frustrated for so long, they finally just said, oh, the heck with it, and pulled out their plans. But yet, um, uh, people point to minority decisions and point to this as a very interesting case where, uh, even though it lost, it had reached the highest uh, levels of judicial discussion, this, this really, really remarkable idea. If we look at the 1973 legislation that brought the Endangered Species Act into law, what exactly was that saying? Was that saying that nature had certain rights? Well, I believe it does. I, I think that that legislation is a landmark uh, one, the 1973 Endangered Species Act. And I think what it really means is that certain non-human residents of the United States are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, non-human residents. Uh, it is saying that when we push a species to the brink of extinction, then clearly the human interest has to back off and give ground to the interest and the right of this uh, pressured species. So the act, while not, not a perfect piece of legislation, represents a, uh, you know, a, a milestone in this idea that nature should have certain rights against human beings. And if it means that humans must not develop a certain area, must not pursue their economic interest in a certain way, in order that another species have habitat and place to live, a place in the sun, uh, then so be it. Then we restrain ourselves. There have been two related but very different movements that have gained strength in the last couple decades. The animal rights movement took off after a 1973 essay called Animal Liberation by the philosopher Peter Singer, who made the case that humans didn't have the right to kill animals in any circumstances. Of course, that ruled out killing animals for food, for one thing. And, and there was another movement as well. We've talked about it before, the deep ecology movement that really came of age around the same time, which posited that every form of life has the right to function normally in the ecosystem and that humans were in no way superior to other creatures of nature. It would seem that those would be complementary movements, but yet there were real conflicts there as well. Yeah, there were very, there were very serious conflicts between the animal liberationists, as they're called, and the uh, the deep ecologists. And, and here, in a nutshell, is, is where the difference was. By taking uh, rights on an individual basis, as we had in the natural rights tradition, that every human being has certain rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, the animal liberationists took that idea, extended it to animals, and said every single cow, every single sheep, every single horse has rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and therefore we should respect those rights and we should not eat those animals and so forth. Um, uh, that's the point of view um, is a difficult one to support 
if you look at the broad ecosystem as a whole. In other words, if animals have rights, then what do you do about wild animals who kill each other all the time? What do you do about mountain lions killing a deer? Is, is the mountain lion compromising the deer's right by killing it? Well, most people would say no, of course not. The mountain lion's only doing what mountain lions do. It's pursuing its place on the food chain. And similarly, people of that persuasion would say that human beings in eating an animal are only uh, pursuing their place on the food chain. What they say is that the animal rightists or the animal liberationists take a much too narrow view. And instead of looking at the rights of every individual cow or sheep, they should look at the broad picture. And they should, they should try to understand that um, predator-prey relationships and uh, uh, eating life and so forth, life eating life, is very much a part of the natural system. And it is that system, it is that process that has to be respected. I think this is very much what Aldo Leopold had in mind with the land ethic, that it was the system, the biological system, that needed to be respected, that life and death and how each that followed each other throughout. So those two points of view the the individual ethics thing on the on the other versus sort of the systemic ethics have uh, come into some fairly sharp conflict and um, a lot of the animal liberation people do not support the deep ecology people and find that they they are at cross purposes i would personally like to see them recognize their their common elements uh, as both working in a certain way toward an extension of ethics and then draw it together. Well, to be a little more explicit about the criticisms that the animal liberationists have put forward of the deep ecologists, they have called the deep ecologists environmental fascists, that fascists. like uh, totalitarian governments that try to create the perfect system as a whole, but yet trample, the, trample over individual rights in the process. Right, sacrifice the individual, just like the fascist state said, we are strong on mass and, and we, 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 we look at the, the well-being of the whole the, the whole state and not the individual as much. Uh, that's true. There have been some bitter bitter charges thrown back and forth uh, from these from these people. The deep ecologists, you know, Steve, like to like to tweak the animal liberationists by saying, "Okay, you guys, you say that, that we shouldn't eat meat. Uh, how about eating uh, grains? How about eating other kinds of things? How about the fact that every time you brush your teeth, you're killing ten thousand bacteria? You know, every time you use deodorant, you're killing bacteria." Uh, they try to reduce it uh, to a sort of an absurd point and suggest that the concept of individual rights is too narrow one. Well, how do the animal liberationists respond to that? Because in some sense, you, get, you have to draw the line somewhere. You have to say certain animals have inalienable rights, but yet you can't keep going down the line of nature forever. That just becomes totally infeasible. It, it does. And everybody has their lines that they draw. Some people, I think Peter Singer draws his lines at oysters or something like this, or some, some creature that does not, does not uh, have uh, a certain consciousness of pain all this is somewhat artificial as i think you uh, you imply in your in your comment that um the main the main thing and here i'll step away from being a scholar for a moment and sort of be an advocate it seems to me the main uh, thing is to keep the integrity of the system the system is composed of many individuals who rotate through it who live and who die just like you and i live and die and other people come through um there are impacts that are justifiable of one form of life on another. When a beaver dams a stream, it kills certain trees. I don't think somebody would come and say, what about the rights of those trees? The beaver is just being a beaver. We also have, I believe, uh, rights to be human beings. And that doesn't mean just eat 600 calories a day. That means to create opera and ballet and public radio broadcasts and write books and print paper, put print books on paper that came from trees and so on and so forth. There are appropriate levels of impact and there are inappropriate levels of impact. And I think what the deep ecologists are trying to tell us is that we have reached a point where we are making inappropriate levels of impact on nature, on the ecosystem, and that we've got to back off. That doesn't mean going back to living in caves and living in skins and hunting and gathering, but it means backing off from some of the extreme impacts that we're making on nature. And of course, um, that would tie into standard of living, and it would tie into numbers of people on the planet, and it would tie into certain technological abuses. Well, part of the idea is that we have to be willing to sacrifice to acknowledge the rights of nature. If we have to cut back the st our standard of living because we are abusing nature to get some of these material goodies, we need to be willing to make that sacrifice. That's right. It involves making a sacrifice. And um, it's, it's the same sort of sacrifice, to put it in a metaphor that may be a little understandable uh, to, to your audience, that we make when we look at other people 
member of environmental ethics thought of as a continuation of this community, a small community, an extension of it. When we look at other people, there's another person in the room with you right now, uh, or any person, the first person you see, you could improve your welfare by taking what that person has. Let's say that person has $57 in his or her wallet, okay, Steve? You could go out there, beat that person over there with a club, take that money, and by gosh, you could, you know, go out to, um, uh, to dinner tonight on that. Now, you don't do that because you respect the rights of that person. So, to carry this metaphor over to the relationship with the earth, we can beat nature over the head, we can take things from it, but it would be a wrong thing to do. There are certain ways that nature can work for us appropriately. That person who has the $57, you could say, uh, um, I would like you to work for me. I'll pay you wages. Uh, that's, of course, what replaced slavery was a wage labor system. Uh, so we can ask nature to work for us in certain ways. But then there are ways that go beyond what is an appropriate level, and then we have abuse. Then we are actually beating nature over the head, taking from nature what is inappropriate. So we restrain ourselves as human beings, and environmental ethics says we should restrain ourselves in our relationship with nature in the same way. Let's talk about how some of these ideas are being put into practice in a public policy sense. We've talked about some legislation such as the Endangered Species Act. There are some radical environmentalists who say that the political process just is too slow and more radical steps need to be taken. And in some cases, these have involved uh, acts of violence. Some have called them acts of terrorism. Animal liberationists have uh, invaded laboratories, destroyed equipment to free animals. Certain ecologists have disrupted uh, the process of cutting down trees. By uh, sitting in the trees or spiking the trees and so on. How much should we make of this newest activism? Well, I think these people are on the cutting edge of, uh, of this, uh, this moral revolution, revolution, if you will. Now, I compare them to John Brown, say in 1859, who went down and, and tried to liberate the slaves. You remember John Brown's raid. It was unsuccessful, and Brown was ultimately hung. But he became a martyr. He became a symbol. He did what he thought was right. He thought slavery was such an intolerable wrong that he had to go down there and try to do something about it. Other people have adopted more sort of civil disobedience ways of uh, protesting the denial of rights to say blacks in the 1960s. Now these environmental radicals are simply saying, we believe this is wrong, and we will not just write a letter to the editor, we want to really take a stand. We want to really try to protect what we regard as our family. Dave Foreman of Earth First has an interesting way of putting it. He says uh, that uh, in protecting nature, I'm only protecting a larger sense of myself. And I believe the trees and animals and wilderness and parks and so forth are, in a larger sense, part of myself. And I am going to defend myself. And he is, he says, if you're meek, the best way to get a sore face is to turn the other cheek. And he says that uh, you've got to stand up for rights. He says everything stands up for rights, and we've got to stand up for the rights of these, of these creatures. Uh, Foreman uh, is, uh, and his colleagues are, are very serious in this. He doesn't talk compromise. He doesn't talk uh, trying to make uh, uh, rape better, say. He says, rape is wrong. He says, if I come home and find a group of hell's angels raping my family, I'm going to blow them away with a shotgun. In the same way, if I go to a, to a forest and find people ravaging and despoiling this forest, I'm going to take action as I feel appropriate to try to defend it. Now, here's a guy who's way out there. Let's fix it. But... Um, uh, again, remember the Civil War and the abolitionist background. Those people like Garrison, who once were considered so eccentric and so far from mainstream, found themselves in 30 years with uh, a large body of the American people behind them. But it's hard to believe that trees and squirrels will ever have the same rights as people. Yeah, yeah, it is. But at one time, it was really hard to believe that blacks would have the same rights as whites. If you were interviewing me in 1807, let's say, uh, with Thomas Jefferson sitting in the room, and you said, Tom, uh, do you think that blacks will ever have the same rights as whites? I mean, that's just an incredible idea. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you're putting yourself in the same, you're revealing a sort of certain moral blindfolds here. Uh, who's to say? Jefferson didn't think that blacks had rights. Uh, there are people today who don't think that squirrels have rights. Um, there are others who felt that they did. Time may be on the side of these things. It may be centuries. Somebody said the only problem with Christian system of ethics is it's never been tried. Um, it may take a long time to perfect, uh, if we can ever perfect, human-to-human -human relations. I mean, even while we've been interviewing uh, this hour, I think statistically in America, 11 people have been raped and 4 people have been killed. 
Um, so we don't have a perfect human-to-human ethical system, but we try. We have certain ideals. And I think what environmental ethics is trying to do is, is put forward some ideals that we can strive to try to live up to. Well, speaking of time, we are out of time. Professor Nash, I want to thank you very much for joining us. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks for the chance to talk about uh, the rights of nature. Roderick Fraser Nash is professor of history and environmental studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the author of The Rights of Nature, A History of Environmental Ethics, published by the University of Wisconsin Press. I'm Steve Paulson. If you would like to purchase a cassette copy of the preceding program, call 263-4123, that's in the 608 area, 263-4123 during normal business hours and ask for the Steve Paulson interview heard on May 27th. This is Wisconsin Public Radio.